Christian Espinoza, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, Jonathan. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation. We've been preparing for this for a bit. And you have a, a real expertise in an area that I haven't interviewed a lot on, uh, and that's around cybersecurity. Uh, and you've recently written a book um, titled Smartest Person in the Room, uh, so we're, which focuses on um, cybersecurity and key traits around effective communication, true intelligence, self-confidence that's important, but sometimes lacking in the field. Uh, so that'll be our focus uh, today as we have this conversation together. As we get started, I wanted to read Christian's bio for everybody. Christian Espinoza is the founder and CEO of Alpine Security, a cybersecurity engineer, certified high-performance coach, professor, and lover of heavy metal music and spicy food. He's also an Air Force veteran and Ironman triathlete. He used to uh, value being the smartest guy in the room, only to realize that his greatest contribution to the fight against cybercrime is his ability to bring awareness to the issue through effective communication. Christian is a speaker, coach, and trainer, and secure methodology, helping to make the smartest people in the room the best leaders in the field. For more information, you can visit www.christianespinoza.com. Um, Christian, gr wonderful background. Uh, I love um, <laughs> that you're a lover of heavy metal and spicy food. I share both of those loves. Um, awesome. <laughs> and I also, I also love your kind of self-awareness around uh, really, the, what was the impetus for writing your book? You know, your 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 previous uh, thinking around being the smartest guy in the room, and really where we can take that, where we can get to more than that. So, so that's going to be our focus today, and ultimately with the goal of how can we lead more effectively our teams, um, generally speaking, but also with your expertise, obviously in cybersecurity, we'll we'll focus on that industry as well. Before we launch in, anything else you would like to share by way of background, personal context, anything like that for our listeners? Uh, you kind of hit on it. Uh, my the What I talk about in the book talks about my, my personal journey as well and my own transformation. Uh, and I used to you know value being the smartest person in the room and I realized that it only got me so far. So I had to, to shift my thinking and, and unlearn a lot of things and apply a different mindset really. So that's ultimately what I wrote about in the book is uh, it's really a personal development book, but focused around uh, my industry and my experience in cybersecurity. Yeah, that, well, that's great. And, and thank you for that additional context. Um, it's interesting too, you, you, you wear a lot of hats and you talk about um, being a professor. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how that balances out with your day-to-day -day in, in everything that you do, mm -hmm. but it, it is interesting from the academic standpoint, that's something that I do as well. And early on in my academic training and as I was going through my PhD program, like I really did have the mindset that I'm the professor, I'm the sage on the stage, I'm, I, I have to be the smartest person in the room, right? Um, I have to portray myself as the smartest person in the room because all these people, all these students are there and they're looking to me for answers. And it, it was quite the awakening, the personal awakening that I had, um, thankfully kind of early on in my academic career where I had the same realization that like, wait a minute, like, yes, I have expertise. Yes, I have to have some answers. And yes, I have to be able to convey with confidence, you know, meaningful material to students. But no, I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. No, I don't have to have all the answers. Um, and in fact, it's a much more dynamic learning environment when we where when we can collectively um, learn together and grow together. And as I facilitate that kind of a learning, um, so I, I appreciate you know your own journey and and how that's played into all this. I, I can relate to that myself. I hope I'm better at that now, you know, than I was you know 15, 20 years ago. Um, but I suppose it's probably a lifelong learning process as well. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, well, good. Well, why don't you um, launch us in, tell us a little bit more about the book, why you decided to write the book, uh, and then we can start to talk about some of those more specific elements around what you see as gaps in the field of cybersecurity. You know, you, you mentioned uh, effective communication, intelligence, mm -hmm. self-confidence, among others. Um, but start us off with a little bit of an understanding for, for why you wrote the book uh, and how 
this, this idea of being the smartest person in the room, how that's uh, connected to the field of cybersecurity. With my company, I started my company, Alpine Security, in 2014. Uh, I personally funded the company. I was the 100% the, you know, owner. So I had to figure a lot of things out because I invested all my money in the business, basically. And it was maybe a year, year and a half into the business where one of my engineers told me that uh, our client did not understand. He said they just didn't get it. Uh, when he was going over the results of a penetration test, which is an ethical hack uh, to that client. And for some reason, maybe because this is my business or there was necessity for me to figure things out, uh, that struck me differently. I'd heard that same thing many times, technical people saying that management doesn't get it, you know, the, the users don't get it, clients don't get it, they don't understand. And I, I just took a a few minutes and kind of like disassociated and and looked at the, the entire situation. I was like, this is my business. Uh, I started a business to make a difference, to have an impact, to actually help our clients become more secure. So they need to get it. <laughs> if they don't get it, they're not going to become more secure. They're not going to understand, uh, you know, the real risk that they're facing. And they're not going to feel understood themselves or appreciated. And that's not the kind of business I wanted to run. And then when I you know, thought about that, I, I looked at my entire career and I realized that this is a common thread in the industry that, that a lot of highly technical people, high IQ and low EQ people tend to talk over people's heads because they want to be the smartest person in the room. And that's what gives them significance. So that was like a defining moment. And then the things I did with my organization, with my business and my team the training, the coaching, the uh, facilitating, all that ended up being the lessons in the book, uh, basically. Yeah, the, your comment about high IQ, low EQ <laughs> resonated with me. And, you know, you run into that a lot. I, I, I you know, I, I uh, teach and do research and consult in the, in the area of, of human development, human resource management, organizational development, change management. And so we're, we're dealing with human beings and trying to, you know, leverage the capacity of people and helping organizations be the most effective as possible, as possible, having a good, healthy culture. Um, and those are challenging things as you have, you know, as we engage with human beings, you know, in the human experience where it's just messy and flawed. And I, I talk to my students all the time about the importance of lifelong learning and, you know, they're, they're preparing for a career in a field that isn't stagnant. Like what they're learning today isn't going to be what's going to help them be successful 10, 20 years from now. Like they have to be continually learning. I'm sure that's exactly the way it is in cybersecurity um, with new technologies and disruption constantly. And, and it's interesting to me because as, as I think about this idea of lifelong learning, um, it requires a certain level of intellectual humility um, to recognize, realize that you ha don't have it all figured out. And I tell my students that some of the dumbest people I know in terms of like functional stupidity are some of the most brilliant people I know. Like they're very high IQ people, very low EQ people is one way to state it. Um, but it also leads into them being overconfident and arrogant in their own expertise and understanding. And because of that, they, it's kind of a tortoise in the hare situation. Like they just, they don't continue to push and grow and develop because they think they have it figured out. Uh, you, you layer on top of that, the EQ stuff of just not being able to relate to people well, talking over people's heads, not, and, and not being able to effectively convey information. And, and you, you have a problem. You have people that are brilliant, but that brilliance is lost, right? And so we need to find ways um, within a really complex world where people are in messy interactions with each other, where we can connect better with each other, where we can uh, recognize the limitations of our own personal understanding and expertise, and that we can all collectively try to learn and grow together uh, and individually, I can see the importance of that for myself, for my organization, for my team. Yeah, and, and I talk about in the book, I have a seven-step methodology, which addresses a lot of things you mentioned. Uh, you know, it starts with awareness. 
uh, and it covers mindset, um, acknowledgement, communication. It, you know, it covers like the the main steps that I think uh, help you with people skills and help you uh, understand that you know life is not just about how smart you are. You know, from an IQ perspective, it's really about how well you live your overall life. Uh, and you know, we interact with people on a daily basis. A lot of People in my industry will and, say, and and I should say, your ability to like get things done and accomplished, yes. right? I know very brilliant people who just never seem to get anything done. They never finish. They they think great thoughts, but it never gets to the end of the row. And again, while I appreciate the 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 raw intelligence, if you can't do something with it, then what's the value of it? Exactly, uh, and. It's also about like realizing that there other people may not be have the same mindset you do, but they add, they can contribute to your team. Because like with me, I used to get frustrated with people weren't like me. I'm like, why can't they? Why does why don't people think like me? Why aren't they gravitating towards this? Why don't they want to take risk? You know, why, why don't they like heavy metal music or whatever? Um, but I realized like everyone has a different model of the world, and there's those different models of the world and the different traits and, and motivations and behaviors people bring to the table is really what makes a good team. Because for instance, with my organization, I hate um, compliance and systems and things like that. So I'm not good at it. I can certainly do it, but I, I it'll fall off the radar and I'm horrible at it. And so what I've found is, you know, someone else that loves that compliments me very well. And together we work better as a, as a team. Yeah, absolutely. Well, can you walk us through uh, more of those um the, the framework that you talk about in your book, and then we can connect that back to your field, specifically cybersecurity and why that's important and how it can help um, individuals and, and team leads to, to better manage within the industry. Yeah, so I've got seven stages or seven steps in the methodology, as I call it. I call it the secure methodology because ultimately, uh, if your inner world is more secure, which I talk about you know, securing, be, being secure with yourself and being certain, within, then I, I believe your outer world will be more secure. So the first step I have is awareness and really understanding your blind spots and what triggers you. I, I talk about NLP a fair amount in the book, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and how we have you know neural pathways, which are basically programs that run our, in our head, that if there's a trigger, like somebody says something a certain way, or you see something, or you hear a siren, or whatever the trigger is, you, you kind of go on autopilot and just start reacting a certain way. And most of us don't realize that. So it's important to be able to have the awareness and stop that so we can uh, you know, respond differently to a scenario and get out of like our normal rut of how we respond. The second step is mindset. I talk about growth mindset versus fixed mindset and how a growth mindset is going to serve you where a fixed mindset will not serve you. Because if you have a fixed mindset, you believe you're, you know, your traits are fixed. A lot of people say in my industry that I'm just not good with people. If that's your mindset, you're never going to be good with people because you've told yourself that you're going to look ways to validate, look for ways to validate that. So I talk about the growth mindset. Uh, then I talk about acknowledgement. That's step three. With acknowledgement, uh, it's important to acknowledge what, you, what you've accomplished yourself and how far you've come, and then also to acknowledge your team. So with me, one of the things I struggle with is uh, I've done a lot of things in my life. I've climbed mountains and Ironmans. I would never like acknowledge myself. I would just like move on to the next thing. And I realized that if I, ha if I have trouble acknowledging myself as a leader, uh, then I'm going to have trouble acknowledging other people. So I, I had to make that shift there. Uh, the fourth one is communication. That's a big topic. Uh, but I refer to it in terms of the N NLP presuppositions. One of them is... Uh, that the mean, meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you just keep that in mind, when you're interacting with somebody, uh, the ownership is on you on, on how to alter your communication. And that goes back to what I talked about earlier where my engineer said they just don't get it. It's our job to make sure they get it. But what happens is a lot of, a lot of the times people will just talk over someone's head or talk in a way that it's not received and then blame the other person. So I, I, I provide some tactics to shift that. And uh, step five is monotasking, which is the uh, opposite of multitasking. 
uh, multitasking is very uh, antiquated in my mind and, and is ineffective. Uh, and monotasking is really what we should be doing from, for two main reasons. One of them is productivity. If you have concentrated focus, uh, you can get much more done than being interrupted all the time with a cell phone or instant message and doing context switching. And the other reason uh, is for presence. If you're communicating with somebody and you're monotasking, you're listening better because you're present on the conversation, which helps with the communication. And the steps go in a specific order because they, they kind of tie to each other. Uh, and then the next step is empathy. Uh, I think we focus as humans too much on our differences versus our similarities. If we're looking at only our differences, like, you know, that person's a manager, I'm an engineer, uh, you know, I'm in this industry, they're in that industry. If we only look at the differences, we kind of forget that we have similarities. It's hard to relate to somebody or build rapport with them uh, or have any sort of empathy for only focused on the differences. And I talk a little bit about cognitive versus effective empathy as well in the book. And then the final step is Kaizen, uh, which is a constant and never need improvement. It's a Japanese term for, uh, you know, continuous improvement, basically. In any journey in life, including the, the seven steps of my methodology, uh, there's going to be peaks and valleys. Uh, and the, the, the outcome you want to be looking at is, is, is am I improving? Because it's not going to be like a light switch. You just flip and all of a sudden, you know, you're an expert in people skills and life skills and anything else. It's, it's a journey. So it's important to understand that starting is often the most difficult part. I was just listening to a um, YouTube video earlier today with Mark Cuban and he said, uh, it was kind of interesting because I always say perfection is the enemy of execution. In terms of business, he said that perfection is the en enemy of profit, which is true. So it's important to keep the mindset of just starting and working to improve that along the journey. Yeah, those are great insights. I, I love all, all of those. Uh, and certainly they have a lot of application beyond your field, uh, I, I think, anyone could pick up that your book and, and read about those those um, those steps uh, that, that that framework and find ways to improve their own personal development their own personal leadership style as it relates to their people um, so I applaud you for that work uh, let, let's connect it back a little bit specifically to cybersecurity you've given a couple examples of where you've had people who are talking over people's heads uh, those sorts of things what what have you seen uh, in terms of the gaps and how your approach in this book can help people to to have a commitment towards their development around these EQ elements. From my perspective, uh, we, and I talk about this in the book, we're losing the cyber war, as I call it. The cyber criminals are stealing our data, hacking our medical devices, uh, you know, holding our systems hostage with ransomware. And we've been trying the same tactics for decades now, a couple decades at least. Uh, you know, newer technology, uh, cybersecurity certifications, complicated frameworks, and it's not working. So I wrote the book based on my experience with my company, but also a motivator was, you know, the industry needs to hear a different perspective because we keep hearing about artificial intelligence firewalls or next gen this or next gen that, but all that stuff is not working. The root issue is I talk about it is the people and that's based on like, I've gotten nearly 30 years experience in cybersecurity and in highly technical career fields. And it's really the people that are doing intellectual bullying. Uh, and in and, and highly technical career fields, if you have a high IQ and a low EQ, typically your significance, which everyone wants to feel significant, typically it stems from being the smartest person in the room or being smarter than other people. And if you're always trying to portray that or find ways to to validate that, then it doesn't lend itself well for coll collaboration or, or, or decent communication uh, or anything, or teamwork really. And one of the struggles in my industry uh, is a lot of highly technical people will say that management doesn't understand, they won't give us the budget. It's typically uh, because the person talking to the leadership or the board of directors or management of the organization does not communicate in a way that makes sense in terms of the business. They're, they're, they, they, they refuse to alter their communication style. And, and this has ramifications in the industry overall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Christian, this is really fascinating. Uh, you, you, you work in a field that, you know, I don't have any 
real direct direct connection to or expertise in at all. So it's fun to hear about all of this, but certainly everything you've been talking about in terms of the framework, in terms of the, the characteristics and the approaches all directly connect with the types of stuff that I'm uh, constantly um, working on. And so I really appreciate your connection. I, I see it as a, an incredibly valuable um, contribution in your field to help move things in the direction they need to go. So we, so we are up to the challenge, not only from a cybersecurity standpoint, you know, dealing with um, the, the challenges and issues there, but uh, people who work in that field are people and employees just the same. And, and we need to have effective teams. We need to have um, a, a, a healthy and safe cultures. And all of that is uh, just as important there as it is, you know, in any other industry or field. I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with me today and to have this conversation. Before we close, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your book uh, and more about what you're up to, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, people can connect with me on my website, christianespinoza.com. Uh, I'm also on social media uh, and my book is available on Amazon. I'm currently working on a course about the seven step methodology so that should be done uh, end of April or so. Uh, and that course will be, uh, you can take it on my, through my website and find out more there. Um, the, I guess the, the message of the day, uh, I would say uh, is listen for insight rather than agreement. Uh, a lot of us tend to enter, enter conversations looking for something to agree or disagree with rather than stepping back and, and actually listening to what that person is trying to communicate. Yeah, great, great tip. I, I think that's so essential. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for all your insights. I encourage listeners to reach out and get connected with Christian. Uh, check out his book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.